Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IETF 108 Administrative and Operations Plenary. My name is Alyssa Cooper, and I'm the chair of the IETF. And thank you for joining us for the plenary. Next slide, please. So I know most of you have been joining sessions already all week. Uh, so you are experts in our online meeting platform, MeetEcho. But just a few reminders uh, that you should have your video and audio off uh, until you join the queue. Later, when we have the open mic sessions, we'll be running the queue as normal um, from same same process as the working group sessions. Um, please only send audio when you're recognized in the queue uh, and then turn it off when you're finished. Um, and state your name and affiliation when you're recognized. And we strongly recommend a headset if you have one. You can check out the participant meeting guide for more details. Next slide, please. So our agenda for today, uh, we'll have a brief welcome and uh, appreciation, and then some updates uh, from myself, from uh, Miria for the IAB, Colin for the IRTF, Barbara for the NOMCOM, and Jay and Jason will provide an IETF LLC update. Next slide, please. And then we'll have the three open microphone sessions, uh, first for the administration LLC, then for the IHG, and finally for the IAB. Next. So first, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our meeting host, Erickson. Um, this is not obviously our typical meeting and um, We've been incredibly thankful to have uh, the ongoing support of Ericsson, even though we couldn't um, all get together in Madrid uh, this time. And uh, it's just been great to have their, their continued support, even though we had to change format. So um, big thanks to Ericsson for serving as our host and for, for being uh, one of our global hosts. Next. I also wanted to thank um, everybody who's uh, come together as a team to um, help make this meeting happen. And that includes um, the Secretariat, the MedEco team, the NOC team, uh, the LLC staff, the tools team, and the folks at gather.town. Um, a large number of people who came together to uh, provide us with the tools that we needed in order to be able to meet in this, uh, this format um, and make everything work and, and be uh, just incredibly responsive to the many corner cases and detailed needs that our community has. So um, it's it's been a great effort. Thank you very much. Next. So I'm just going to give a brief report from uh, myself and the ISG. Next. Three topics today. The first one is participant statistics. Uh, the next one is about uh, planning for future meetings. And then I'll touch on some changes that we're um, anticipating for the, the BOF request process uh, from between now and IETF 109. Next. So here at IETF 108, we have uh, 1,051 uh, on-site participants. That's um, people who have uh, uh, registered for the meeting. Last week, we ran the hackathon uh, mostly asynchronously, and we had 295 hackathon registrations. Um, so both of those numbers are, are pretty close to what we normally get for an in-person meeting, um, which is nice. Um, because of the nature of this meeting, that we still have people who can register during the week and show up, um, and uh, we didn't want to give only a partial attendance report, we will be publishing the detailed attendance statistics after the meeting is over. So the normal um, country breakdowns and other um, uh, details that we normally provide will be published after the meeting. So you can look out for those uh, uh, announced on email. Next. So this brings us to future meeting planning. And there's a few um, items I wanted to highlight here. In terms of short-term planning, uh, like feedback for IETF 109, um, there's a couple of different uh, mechanisms that we're using for feedback. For the tooling, if Okay. Can somebody verify that my audio is audible? Yeah, you're back now. 
Okay, sorry, I was just silently uh, had my audio and video revoked. So, um, so for reporting uh, issues in real time uh, with respect to MeetEcho, oh, thanks. Um, you can use the tickets email address, and uh, those will be tracked. And there's a there's a URL on our on our reporting page where you can go see all the tickets. Um, and for Jabber, there's the MTD at IETF.org address. So that's like if you're having difficulty during the meeting, please file a ticket, um, and you will get a response. If you oh, let's stick on short term planning, yeah. So if you have um, more longer term feature requests for uh, the platform, please take those to Tools Discuss. There's already robust discussion over there about um, features that people would like to see, things that people don't like, um, and so on. Please be respectful, but um, share your, your feedback about the tools on, uh, on Tools Discuss. And that's anything to do with um, the Mean Echo platform or the Data Tracker integration. For other planning aspects, um, for IETF 109, we have, we're planning to use the same assessment criteria that we used uh, last time to make a decision about whether we can run the meeting in person versus online. Um, and uh, planning to use the same meeting fee structure as well, but these are open for consultation right now. So um, if you have uh, input about those choices, please send that to many couches at ietf.org and we'll take the feedback in um, and adjust uh, if we need to. And many couches is also the place where we're going to be uh, gathering feedback about agenda planning for IETF 109. So many couches is the list to use. The other really important way that people can provide feedback is by filling out the IETF 108 meeting survey, which will be circulated after the meeting closes. Um, we got a great response last time uh, to the meeting survey, and it's really our only way of getting structured feedback uh, to guide our decisions about how we plan the meetings. So if you have strong opinions about how the meetings should be organized or whether we should have meetings at all, that kind of thing, um, please uh, fill out the meeting survey once it gets circulated. And then finally, uh, we've set out a timeline for decision making for IETF 109. And we've said that um, August 31 is the date when we will be announcing whether 109 will be an in-person meeting or an online meeting and what the fee structure will be uh, for that meeting. So now you can plan a little bit. For longer term planning, we also have a few activities going on. So we have a new working group, Stay Home Meet Only Online or SHMU. And SHMU is gonna be working on guidelines for a number of different aspects. Um, how do we decide about making in-person meeting cancellations? Um, how do we plan for certain high-level aspects of the meeting? If we do take it fully online, um, we're gonna be talking about functional technology requirements, uh, the meeting fees, the cadence of meetings, all of that good stuff. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, again, if this is a place where you have um, you know, constructive suggestions for what we should do or what the guidelines should say that can guide the IHG and the IETF LLC as we do the meeting planning, um, then please um, join the mailing list, to, uh, write a draft, come to the meeting, which is happening on, um, on Friday, this Friday at 11 UTC. We also have an activity going on uh, where the current focus of the discussion is in the Gen Dispatch Working Group. And this relates to um, non-COM eligibility updates uh, in part motivated by the fact that our current uh, non-COM eligibility criteria rely on in-person meetings and that's obviously creating difficulty. So we, we put in sort of a short-term uh, fix for this, the non-COM cycle this year, uh, but we need something that is uh, more long-lasting that can deal with um, the, the 2020 year, which is obviously shaping up to be quite different from, from every other year. Um, so if that's something that is of interest to you, please read the draft and um, come to the Gen Dispatch meeting, which will be tomorrow at um, 1300 UTC. Next slide, please. So, uh, this we circulated to the ITF mailing list yesterday, but I uh, wanted to um, get it in front of people because it has a has a new deadline in it. Um, so we're changing the process a little bit for um, birds of a feather requests. We're experimenting uh, with a change in process in this next cycle. So what we're asking is that by September 18th that we want to hear from BOF proponents in the IHG would like to hear from BOF proponents um, if you're planning to propose a BOF. 
You don't have to have your complete proposal done by September 18th, but please send email to the ISG and post an entry in the BOF wiki um, by that date if you are even thinking about proposing a BOF. And then we're going to take the two weeks after that to have the ADs work with the proponents to refine their proposals. What we found in past cycles is that we're really time crunched um, between the, the deadline when we ask for the complete proposals and when we have to approve or decline them for scheduling purposes. So we're trying to give ourselves a little bit more time to work with the community um, to make the proposals better and, and hopefully um, uh, get more high quality BOF scheduled. So we're gonna take two weeks to do that. And then October 2 is the deadline for complete requests to be posted to the BOF wiki. And that's the same deadline that was previously announced in the important dates. Um, and we'll take a week to to figure out which ones we approve for scheduling. So that's a bit of a change and hopefully the extra time will help us um, have, have better BOF slate next time. Next slide, please. So there's more information covered online. We've had two appeals uh, in the last cycle. You can go read both uh, the appeals and the response text. Um, and there's lots more reports from uh, many of the other uh, groups involved in the IETF that you can find on the meeting materials page and uh, we post semi-regular updates to the ITF blog as well. Next. And I will turn it over to Miria for the IAB update. Yeah, hello, yeah. Everybody. hello everybody. Good morning, good, morning. good, good, morning. Afternoon. good, afternoon. good evening. Good evening. Uh, given this uh, is given such an odd time for some people, I will keep it very brief if we go to the next slide. Yeah, that's kind of the same slide, so one more. <laughs> Yeah, so we already submitted uh, the IEB report with all the reporting uh, on the more administrative tasks um, to the proceedings of this meeting. So you can just go there um, and have a look and read everything. Um, but this, I would like to use the opportunity to also cover um, some of the new and ongoing things we are doing in the IETF. Uh, and this is three things. The IEB open meeting we held yesterday already, um, some upcoming program proposal and workshop and a quick thanks to everybody who um, serves as an appointee. Let's go on the next slide. Yes, so yesterday we had a new thing which is called the IB Open Meeting. Um, it already happened yesterday, you can watch the recordings, um, but the idea here really was just to provide a, a, for a forum for more interaction with the community from like two angles. One thing is we want to provide information to the community about the things we are doing right now in the IAB, focusing on the technical and architectural work we do in the IAB. And then we would also like to use this forum to get input from the community on the work we are doing and have some more interactive communication than we could have on a mailing list or somewhere else. So what we had yesterday was uh, discussing a couple of IB drafts or one actually only <laughs> workshops and programs. Um, you can check the agenda. And if you have any feedback on this session, um, please send it directly to us, to the IB at IB. Uh, ib at ib.org or um, you can also use the architecture discuss list for any public discussion with the community and with us of course we also on this um, i believe generally people uh, found this positive uh, but i'm happy to hear more feedback next slide then about some ongoing efforts, uh, efforts I would like to highlight. Uh, one thing is that we're currently discussing a new program on evolvability, deployability and maintainability. Um, so you can also find more information in the slides from the IAB open meeting, but we already created a mailing list to have more discussion on that. Um, so that's one thing you want to know about maybe. And the other thing is a quick announcement for a workshop we are planning for in November. This workshop will be virtual um, and it's uh, covering um, things we we want to uh, discuss based on the on the crisis we've been seeing right now where we see like this increase in network traffic so it's about measurements about operational practice um, we will very soon send out a call for contributions so that gives you more information but there's also more information in the slides from the IB open meeting yesterday already next slide and with that i just want to say quickly thank you to everybody who's serving in an appointed position, uh, but also everybody who put their name in and was potentially not appointed and also everybody who provided feedback. Uh, we really need support here. Uh, and that's it from my side. Thank you very much. We can switch to Colin. Hi, uh, 
my name is Colin Perkins. Uh, I'm the IRTF uh, chair. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so the IRTF is the uh, the, the research arm of the the IETF. Uh, it's here to do research uh, rather than to develop standards. Uh, the IRTF is organized as a set of research groups. Uh, the, the slide lists the, the set of active research groups we have. Uh, those in blue uh, are meeting this week. Uh, I think the, most of them have met already. I think only the, the computation in the network group is still to meet. Uh, but but do, do look out for the meetings and, and um, pl pl please do participate. Um, if you're not familiar with the way the IRTF works and how it differs from the IETF, we also have RFC 7418, which uh, talks about the differences between the organizations and uh, provides a, a primer for the uh, IETF participants. Next slide, please. In addition to the research groups, the IRTF organizes a bunch of other activities. Uh, one of the most important of those is the Applied Networking Research Workshop. This is uh, an academic research workshop that we organize in conjunction with ACM SIGCOM. Uh, this year, it's happening uh, tomorrow and Friday, uh, co-located with, with the IETF uh, and running alongside all the, the, the IETF and IRTF meetings. The chairs of the workshop are Miria and, and Roland this year. Uh, they've done a really good job putting to get together a really interesting program. Um, if you look at the, the URL on the slide, um, you'll find all the papers uh, and links to all the papers on on, on that website. The papers are all available open access in the ACM Digital Library, uh, and I would very much encourage you to uh, have a look, read the papers, and consider joining the sessions uh, later in the week. Next slide, please. In addition to that, um, we also organized the Applied Networking Research Prize. Um, the Applied Networking Research Pr Prize is uh, something we do in conjunction with the Internet Society, uh, with sponsorship from Comca Comcast and NBC Universal, uh, and it's uh, awarded for recent results in applied networking research that are relevant uh, potentially for transitioning into shipping products and related standards efforts. There were three uh, ANRP prize-winning talks yesterday um, from Bano talking about her work on uh, developing a taxonomy of internet liveness from Chow Yi uh, talking about DNS over encryption uh, with some measurements of uh, DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS, and from Ingmar talking about uh, traffic engineering and steering hypergiant traffic. Uh, three re really nice talks. Uh, I'd encourage you to watch the recordings, which are on the IETF YouTube channel. In addition, uh, the nominations for the ANRP Awards for 2021 will open in just a few weeks on the 1st of September. Uh, and the nomination deadline is the 22nd of November, immediately after the uh, ITF 109 meeting. If you've uh, read any uh, good um, uh, applied networking research papers recently, I would very much encourage you to, to nominate. Uh, the, the URL on the website uh, will, will have details from the 1st of November. OK, that's everything from me. Thank you. Barbara's next. Barbara, you need to request to send audio. No? no. Oh, yes. okay. Now we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so the NOMCOM has started its work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we had our first call last week. Um, and this is who the seated members are. We had some fun with our seating. Um, you know, we did have a couple of challenges come through, which uh, I have survived, thankfully. Um, and if you have further questions about that, uh, you can always go on to the IETF list, um, you know, in your spare time and, and when you just want to have a little fun and read all about that. Um, but I think this is going to be a fabulous group of people. I'm really thrilled um, that all these people are on the NOMCOM this year. Um, next slide, please. 
And we do have a lot of positions to fill. Uh, they just keep growing, uh, although I think it um, right now it's the same as what uh, Victor had last year, uh, but it is certainly quite a few. Um, and we are going to be starting our meetings next week to get uh, things going with questionnaires and making sure we understand what all the uh, the expectations are for each of these seats. And, uh, you know, this week I've been meeting with people during NOMCOM office hours. So next slide, please. So uh, one, one of the things we did do um, during our first meeting is set our schedule. Uh, there are a couple of dates I really want to uh, highlight for people. Um, the call of nom for nominations we are expecting to have start on August 25th with questionnaires available on September 1st. Now the interviews and the office hours. I'd like to call your attention to those dates. There are two weeks set now for the nominee interviews. We intend to spread them across the two weeks prior to IETF 109, whatever format or wherever, or however that one may be held. We will be holding the interviews the two weeks before. We do realize one of those weeks is um, a vacation, a common vacation week for many people, but that's why we have two weeks. Um, so hopefully that will meet people's needs. We will be uh, having interview slots that are throughout the 24-hour day period. Our NOMCOM members are from a wide range of time zones themselves. And so we're going to try to have interview slots where both the NOMCOM interviewer and the nominee are awake at the same time. And uh, we think this is completely doable in our new view virtual world. And we expect to be doing our uh, interviews by WebEx. The office hours and uh, request for, um, you know, private office hours during that period of time is going to actually be three weeks. So the two weeks where we're having interviews, we will have some office hours set. And also the week of IETF 109, we will have some weeks, I mean, some office hours set so that we can get community feedback. So next slide, please. The main thing that we really need is all of you. We need for you to nominate yourself, nominate somebody else, um, but not as a joke, just because you think they would actually be awesome at the job. Um, and we really need for feedback on the nominees. Um, yes, we were randomly selected, but we are your randomly selected group of people. And we really need to represent the community. And the way we can best represent the community is we, if we hear from the community and if the community members actually stand. And, you know, even if you're going up against an incumbent, I have to say, you know, myself that just the experience of standing as a nominee is incredible. It's really good. And it really teaches you so much about how IETF operates and um, what it takes to be a leader within IETF and to understand what the ADs and the IAB people really go through. I highly recommend the experience um, just, you know, to anybody who wants to understand more about IETF to stand for a position and also please give us the feedback. So next slide. Um, so here's some information about us. I don't want to be some aloof IETF NOMCOM. We are not aloof. We are your NOMCOM. And you know, again, I can't stress um, strongly enough that we really need for you to come and talk to us. Uh, the data tracker is where I'm going to be trying to keep uh, the NOMCOM 2020 page up to date um, with information about what's going on with us. The, our schedule is there. All of the people are there. We currently have one office hour still for this week. I set three. Our first uh, office hour was uh, we actually had several people come by and provide some input as to um, qualities they would like to see in some of the uh, positions, you know, that they would like the NOMCOM to consider when when um, screening candidates and things like that. 
Um, and we had people asking questions about NumCom and what it takes and things and, and such. And so we've got the one office hour left on Thursday. I did uh, try to set the three office hours at various times of the day uh, so that they were spread widely apart so that people from various regions, again, I really want to try to be inclusive and to be able to represent the entire IETF community. Um, and if you need more from your NOMCOM, just drop me a note. You know, there's the NOMCOM email. Um, I've been hanging out and gather, and I've been having various random conversations where people, you know, even though it's not office hours, when they find me there, some of them bend my ear about um, NOMCOM, and that is fine. Um, so just talk to me, people. Um, Okay, and I've already mentioned about the 109 office hours. So next slide, I think, is my thank you. Oh, yeah, right. So let's make this, uh, <laughs> it's a special year already, but let's try and put a positive spin on it. Let's see how we can make it special in a way that really makes things better. I would love to see more nominees and more feedback. And I'd really love to see more diversity in what we have coming at us um, from the nominees being diverse, from the feedback coming from people all around. Um, just I want to hear from you one way or another. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Next, we have Jay and Jason. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Jay Daly. I'm the IETF Executive Director. Um, I'm going to do first half of the IETF Administration LLC presentation with the LLC Board Chair, Jason Livingood, doing the second part. Um, next slide, please. And next slide again. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, the ITF 108 host, Ericsson. Um, it's been very, uh, it, it, Ericsson have understood that moving to an online meeting is quite different from an in-person meeting and has different challenges. And they've worked with us to make this a, a successful meeting. Um, such things as um, sponsoring the t-shirts to be delivered to you and other things. And so we're very um, grateful to them for that. Next slide, please. Um, we've had Akamai as our silver sponsor, who have been um, very good again, carrying on their sponsorship with us, and ICANN continuing their hackathon sponsorship. Um, we're at the stage now where all our sponsors recognise the value that um, they get from uh, an online meeting compared to an in-person meeting, so we're managing to roll quite well with our sponsors through to this meeting now. Next slide, please. And um, for this um, particular meeting, we had two new sets of sponsors. Firstly, the fee waiver sponsors, Google, Fastly and Futureway. So thanks to them um, who've enabled us to uh, pay for large numbers of the fee note we waivers, which we'll be talking about in a minute. And for Google um, Cloud Developer Relations, who have sponsored the Google Cloud service that we're using that um, MeetEcho is currently running in. So thank you to those of you as well. Next slide, please. Um, our equipment sponsors give extraordinarily generously to us, um, Cisco and Juniper. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's always very nice to have um, new equipment come every three years to maintain things. Next slide, please. And so there are two um, local sponsors from Madrid who I want to thank, who put an enormous amount of work in, even though we haven't used them now. Um, the IPv6 company, or um, Geordie, as many of you know, and Cult, um, who are putting circuits in for us and things. So thank you both very much. Even though we didn't use you, you put a lot of work in and we recognize that. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, I'm not going to read out all of the names, but I thought it was important for you to see just how many people are involved in this, both on the volunteer side here on this slide and on the next slide in terms of staff and contractors. So um, thank you very much to all of these people. Um, as you can see, we have a large number of people who um, put their time in to make this work. Thank you. Next slide. 
Um, so IETF 109 um, is currently planned for Bangkok um, and that will be hosted by Cisco. Thank you very much. As Alyssa has explained earlier, we have a process underway to determine whether or not that can carry on as an in-person meeting or whether we need to switch that to an online meeting. Um, we will find out about that as people um, give us feedback and as then we then do the assessment um, in late August. Next slide, please. And finally, I want to thank all of our global hosts um, who, uh, so for those of you who don't know, a global host signs up to a multi-year contract with us, six or nine years. They give us money every year throughout that, and they host a number of meetings as part of that. And they have been um, uh, very helpful in, well, we get an enormous amount of funding from them. We couldn't run the meetings without them. So thank you to Cisco, Comcast, NBC Universal, Ericsson, Huawei, Juniper, and Nokia. Thank you. Next slide, please. So here are our future meeting locations and venues. Um, we have ITF 109 coming up next in Bangkok, as mentioned. March next year is ITF 110 in Prague. Then San Francisco, um, which is a, uh, a rescheduled meeting from a previous meeting. And then 112 in Madrid, which is where we're rescheduling this meeting to. Um, we're keeping 113 open in case we need to shift Bangkok to there. And then we have Philadelphia in for 114. And um, if you are interested in sponsoring a meeting, then please contact us and uh, open up your checkbooks. Fantastic. Next slide, please. So these are the registration numbers as of yesterday. Um, and we we're preparing the slides, so they're not um, as up to date as the ones Alyssa gave you. And they're broken down by the type of ticket that we have, and you can see the budget that we have there as well. So, for example, we had um, we budgeted for 500 early birds, and we had 485. Um, so the it's roughly within line with our budgeting here. We've exceeded the number of registered slightly, so um, which is very pleasing. But um, it, it's good news for us in terms of the financial viability of an online meeting. It has worked out very well. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, as a bit of transparency, I've put in here some details about the things that I'm doing as the um, ITF executive director. Um, and you probably guess much of my work has been on um, number two on this, managing the impact of COVID-19 and the switch to a fully online meeting. Uh, I'm still relatively new and I still don't get out to meet any of you because we're all in isolated countries. Um, and so the community engagement support is still a big part of my work here. And there are some other things that I'm working on there. Uh, you'll, you'll find that if you're interested more in this, that I put significant details into my monthly um, report that I do for the board meetings. And those are published as part of the board meeting minutes. Um, next slide, please. So that's for it for me. And I'm going to hand over to um, Jason for the next part now. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jason Livingood, I'm chair of the ITF LLC board. Next slide, please. So this is who we are, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, um, Maya, Alyssa, Sean, Peter, and me. Um, certainly uh, would like to have been uh, in person someplace, but uh, such as it is, um, these are uh, the members of the board. Next slide, please. Uh, we do publish well in advance our board meeting dates, and you can find those on our website, of course. These are the ones that are coming up um, in the next several months. You can feel free to join them uh, remotely. We don't often have many people join, so we would love to have more folks join a meeting, and we tend to open up a little bit of time for Q&A towards the end of the public session. So if you do have time, um, please encourage you to join if you're interested in any other work that we're doing. Next slide, please. So some recent board work completed. Um, I'll note at the top, obviously COVID-19 has been extremely disruptive, um, certainly. And uh, I would say that, um, uh, you know, we had hoped to sort of stabilize uh, our finances and our understanding of our costs and so on and make this a good um, foundational year. Of course, all those plans thrown up in the air, but I think we've been doing a good job and you'll see some of the financials um, coming up in a moment. But we did achieve a number of things that we're proud of. Um, first and foremost, our first independent audit 
there were no issues. So basically the full financial year, first full financial year um, for the LLC was completed. And then we had that audited by our new um, CPA firm. And it was great to get through that with no issues flagged. Um, and we blogged about that at the time. Um, we started to implement the investment policy statement, um, which is good. Um, we revised, of course, um, both our fiscal year budget and uh, the exec, exec director goals based on COVID-19 changes and uh, some other uh, small work on procedural changes. Really, the next two bullets are the key things for us for this year, which is to lock in a long-term financial support agreement with the, I, uh, with the Internet Society, excuse me, and um, to then figure out what our fundraising and sponsorship strategy is that would support that going forward. So hopefully we'll have a lot more to report on by the next ITF meeting, but that's our key focus for the year. Next slide. And uh, here you can find um, an update based on our recent financials, but given all the disruptions of meetings and so on, it's great to see that um, we haven't had a humongous disruption financially and appreciate um, you know, Jay uh, and his leadership there to help. Uh, but that's a, a big achievement. I think we feared much, much worse of an impact. And uh, I think we came out relatively good at this point. Next slide. So these are all the ways that you can contact us. Feel free to reach out at any time. Um, next slide. And that's all for now. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So I think we're gonna move on to the open mics. Yes. So for the open mic uh, portions, we have Michael Richardson in the Jabber room who's serving as the Jabber scribe. So if you don't have audio and um, you want to ask a question, please just put it into the Jabber chat with the preface Mike colon and he will um, relay that for you. And we're going to be doing introductions, I think, shortly. But after that, um, it might be beneficial for uh, everyone participating to switch into gallery view, and you'll be able to see the people speaking a little bit better because the slide won't be very useful to you. Um, and you can switch to gallery view using the second icon in the upper right hand portion of the screen, the one that looks like it has a little group of people in it. So that might improve people's viewing experience. And with that, I will turn it back to Jason. Thanks. So happy to take any questions. Hey, Jason, it's Pete Resnick. Um, Hi, Pete. Uh, hopefully an easy one. Um, how many people were able to use the fee waiver this time? And, uh, you know, I, just thinking in terms of, is it burdensome to do so or did it turn out really well? Sure, great question for Jay, who I think um, hopefully we can get, there he is. Um, okay. Jay, you've been tracking and administering all of this. Um, what did the final numbers look like? So um, I think we're at about 175 or something of the fee waivers. Um, and uh, we budgeted for 115, um, thanks to our sponsors there. So it's been a, um, it's a noticeable chunk of the um, uh, registrations, but um, it's, it certainly, uh, in terms of the numbers, it feels like we've still got a very large number of people participating. So um, this, is, this it's not as though we've lost anything by people switching to fee waivers or anything like that. Um, and it's been fine to administer, very reasonably straightforward. And we haven't done any form of um, checking or analysis to see if anybody has um, uh, could have done something else. We've just accepted people on their word for it. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting as we do the post-meeting survey uh, particularly to see if there are any questions that might be uh, interesting, especially are those new participants? Are they new to the ITF and so on? So, thanks. Other questions from folks? Looks like we've got Jim Reed in the queue. Can I speak? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you. If the meeting goes ahead in Bangkok, 
will you be projecting that on a lower attendance rates than you would normally expect to physically show up for the meeting? I'll pick that up then, Jason. Um, yeah. it, uh, it's a good question, Jim. So our, our, our um, assessment process is effectively a two-step one where um, we determine whether or not it's viable for the meeting to go ahead and then the IESG determines whether there are sufficient numbers for people to go ahead. Um, I haven't done extensive work, well any work particularly on what the numbers would be if we went ahead with an in-person meeting yet. Um, that's part of the assessment process that I do at the end of August and that's when I would have a better answer for that question um, because that's when we look at travel bans and um, various other things like that. Yeah, I think it'd be a good idea to try and get a survey of who many people would be prepared to go to Bangkok assuming their employer would let them. Yeah, we, we if that that's our second stage. So if the first stage is that we think it is possible, viable to hold a meeting there, then we would probably go to that as a second stage. Um, I think you can make your own judgment on what the um, uh, the first stage is likely to deliver that. Yeah, thanks to you. But Jim, uh, you know, good point about uh, employer travel. You know, I know many uh, companies that send IETF participants um, to meetings have travel restrictions in place. Um, so that may be a factor. And of course, we're seeing a lot of resurgence globally. So we'll see. Um, looks like we've got another person in queue. Yeah, hi, can you hear me, Jason? Uh, we can indeed, thanks. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's also related to uh, uh, IETF uh, 109, just really two quick points. Uh, first is just adding to Jim's point. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm concerned about the availability of travel insurance. Um, so even if it's possible to go, if, if, uh, I think it might be quite challenging to get uh, a, a travel insurance, um, which I think will be an issue for some of us. Um, and also, uh, I've noticed, as I'm sure you have, that uh, we're starting to see some pretty big high profile events for early next year moving to virtual you would have seen that i'm sure the notice about uh, uh, ces uh, in january uh, going to be virtual so um i personal view i, I think uh, the, the the practicalities of doing a face-to-face -face events in november are extremely questionable but uh, that's just my opinion very good point thanks for the input uh, looks like we've got another person in the queue. Whoops. Huh. I think we can hear you. Oh, you can. OK, I thought I yes. got bounced out. Right. <laughs> nope. um, I, I do love this Meet Echo tool, though, really. Um, my question is, um, let's assume maybe we have um, we have uncertainty about different people's travel, or maybe some people just really liked the really intensive uh, online. Can we consider, maybe you already have said this, having a full-on Meet Echo presence that empowers the remote people as well as in person? Jay, you wanna take that? Uh, yeah. Um... I think that is probably tied up into the work going on in SHMU about what people want for online meetings, um, even though it's related to in-person. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, convinced that it's sensible for uh, us in the LLC to go ahead and start making some dis decisions about the meeting process in that way or the meeting experience in that way. That's something more for the ISG and others to do and that's the, the process currently is to go through that. So um, uh, tweaks and other things, yes, but if you're talking about a major overhaul of the way that the interaction between in-person and online takes place and I think that requires community guidance to help us understand how to deliver that. But that being said, Bay, just to, to add to that, I mean, I think it's certainly the case, um, whether you look at our online meeting tools or other online collaboration tools, I think everyone's expectations as a result of working remotely from the pandemic have really increased quite a bit. And so, um, you know, it's important for us to step up our tooling. And, and I do want to make a mention here of the Meet Echo team. I mean, the, the work that they've done has been phenomenal and, uh, you know, really, really appreciate um, you know, the quick development and uh, turnaround on a lot of the features. So really nice work. 
this one. Any other questions in queue? Can I jump in real quick on this one? Or of can course, yeah, me? please please go ahead. Yeah, so I was just gonna say, Allison, that um, there's like a really wide array of opinions about this question, which is uh, just to reinforce what Jay said, like why the Shmoo process is so important. Like there's people who never wanna have a plenary meeting again, and then um, all the way to like, you know, emphasizing the face-to-face -face and um, sort of the, the model that we were going with before and everything in between. So. Um, we really need to kind of uh, try to coalesce around what the model or models is that um, the bulk of the community is interested in, um, because in in the absence of that, we just have to like make a guess or make a choice one way or the other without um, you know having a good sense of what the community wants. Great, thanks. Anyone else in queue? Doesn't look like it. Um, so I think, thank you very much. Appreciate your time for uh, the LLC Q&A period. We'll move on to the next one. All right, thanks. So the next one is going to be the IESG and we're gonna do a quick round of introductions um, just so people can hear our voices and, uh, and see our faces hopefully. Um, so, Alvaro, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Alvaro Rathana, Alvaro Rathana. Rathana. Debra? Debra, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Okay, maybe we'll come back to Debra. Martin? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I just lost complete internet connection. Uh, so Martin Vigor, um, speaking, routing AD. Okay, Murray's next. Marie Kucharavi, applications in real time. Applications in real time. Thanks, Barry. Roman? Roman Danilio, security area. And I'm Ben Kato, security area. Martin Duke, transport area. Transport. Robleton, uh, Ops Area, Fix and Management. Hey, I'm Warren Kamari. I'm the Operations Side of Ops and Management. I'm Mia Kuliband. I'm the IEB Chair. So I stand up and we move forward. So Eric Vink, I am the internet AD. Okay, I think we got everybody except Deborah who's having some audio issues. So hopefully Deborah, uh, by the time we have a question to answer, that'll be sorted out. So the mics are open, the mics. Everybody's mic in their own house is open. All right. Greg, go ahead. Hi. Um, um, I have a question about um, IPR disclosure. Um, recently encountered the problem and trying to solve it. So um, who uh, can I turn to? Thanks, Greg. Um, 
I think it depends a little bit on the nature of the of the problem. So um, um, yeah, the problem is uh, with the uh, confirmation of uh, email of the person oh, that right. submits yeah. the disclosure. Is, yes, I'm. I apologize um, if I didn't actually respond to your email because that is being actively investigated. We're trying to figure out what the problem is on our side. So yeah, yeah I have a suspicion. Yeah. So if somebody who is investigated uh, reaches to me directly. I can give a clue and uh, we can go on uh, from there. Yeah, we will. Uh, I'll get back to you after the, the plenary. I apologize for not Thanks. responding. Thanks a lot. Right, right in the run up to the IETF. Yeah, no worries. OK, I think Pete is next. Hello there. Um, so I noticed uh, a thread on the IETF list uh, that's gotten kind of long. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that thread. Um, so a, a couple of quick things. First, uh, John, I think, made a comment on the list that the last minute nature of the IASG statement uh, was uh, probably a little uh, problematic and lesson learned, but I, I agree that the timing should be a little earlier before meeting, um, and a request that folks who are participating in that thread uh, take a beat and remain a little calm. Uh, it, it's it, it's a controversial topic. It's bound to get snippy, and so people need to be a little more empathetic with others and maybe talk to folks offline and not assume that they're just being idiots. Um, but all that said, the, the reason that I bother to get in the mic line is a request to the ISG. If you've got a controversial topic coming out, and I don't think any of the ISG members were surprised that this one was going to be controversial, it would be really good to stick someone on the ISG or someone that they choose with the task of managing the discussion and occasionally inserting a, okay, we've heard this and here's uh, what we've heard out of the conversation, because without that, people have a tendency to repeat themselves and repeat themselves, and uh, it, it's become non-useful and, for some folks, unreadable, uh, and I hope that we could get that in the future. Thanks. It's Pete, and I think um, that was Pete Resnick for, for people who uh, couldn't discern if, if you can state your name when you come to the mic, that's uh, that's helpful. Um, so I'll just give my own uh, response and let other people chime in. But um, from my perspective, I haven't seen the message about, about the, the statement being last minute, but I frankly think it's like decades overdue. So um, I don't find it to be last minute at all. Uh, we should have done it a, lot, a long time ago. Um, and it wasn't really in relation to the meeting necessarily. I, I just, just to um, comment on so. that, Alyssa, it wasn't a question of whether it should have been done sooner or later, but more that three days before the IETF meeting um, made it such that uh, it, it sort of blew up and there was a lot of other things going on. Not, not that it shouldn't have been as soon as possible. That's exactly right. Um, it, it, it is decade, it, it's quite a bit too late, but just that timing it right near the meeting was was tricky um, and made the conversation and I think IASG involvement in that conversation harder. That's all. Okay, I mean, I, I still, I, I feel that people maybe need to reread the statement um, because the first paragraph is like a statement of what the IASG believes. And I understand that there's like lots of effort to try to influence us about what we believe, but it's just a statement of belief. And um, if people wanted to comment on that, that's that's you know their prerogative. Um, but it it wasn't necessarily like inviting us to comment back. It's just a statement of our belief. And the second paragraph talks about like welcoming you know further discussion in the community uh, in a you know in the structured way that we have it um, towards the draft and gen dispatch. So I can appreciate that. Um, there's nothing that we can do to prevent people from starting a thread on IETF at IETF. Uh, but if you actually read the words in the statement, I think they tell you something different from, from what people have been reading into them. Warren, I don't know if you actually want to speak or not. Um, did you want to jump in? Okay. 
controlled them at all. I don't think Warren is trying to speak. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody else piping up. So I think we can move on to the next question. Andrew. Um, I, with apologies, uh, uh, but I just want to go back to the point that Pete made. The, the timing of put, pushing out that, that uh, statement, just literally just a handful of days before an IETF meeting was especially unhelpful. Um, given it was quite predictable, the volume of responses it generated, um, which meant that the volume of uh, noise coming from the various mailing lists uh, quickly became unmanageable. Um, it became a distraction rather than having a much more constructive discussion about what ought to be an important topic. Um, so I think that the timing was at best unfortunate. And I, I'd urge people to reflect in future for such announcements to not put them out just before an ITF meeting. Okay, Rich. Um, I think it's going to be um, a noise fest no matter when it happens and having it just when people's minds are focused on the IETF and publications of documents it seems reasonable to me. Yeah, it's going to be unfortunate whenever it is. I speak from experience. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the ISG? Dan, go ahead. Yeah, just as a jabber scribe, there's a couple of there's two questions I see in the in the chat room. Um, the most recent one is the RFC editor has a long backlog. Who will fix that? And there was a previous one that I've lost in the chat, but it was a question about the nomcom. Are all the incumbents running again? So the two questions for the group. Okay. <laughs> Barry, would you like to respond? The, generally, the um, by the time the requests go out for volunteers for the NOMCOM selected positions, some of us have declared whether we'll be standing again or not, and the NOMCOM chair will announce that with the uh, solicitation of volunteers. Sometimes people, sometimes incumbents decide after people have started to put their names in. But generally the NOMCOM chair uh, lets the community know as soon as the, the incumbents have declared whether they'll be standing again. And I'll say for me, I do not intend to stand for art AD again. And I hope the art area will put forth a number of good candidates, including the ones who stood last time. Thanks, Barry. Um, so to the first question, there's a few um, compounding factors that have affected the, the length of the RFC editor's queue. Uh, the main one that's still in play right now is um, something called Cluster 238, which is the group of 40 or so documents that um, are defining the WebRTC uh, protocol suite and have a web of interdependencies that have caused them to um, all hit the, the publication queue at once. So about half of those are um, finished with Auth48 and about half of them still need to complete Auth48. So hopefully when that cluster is done, well, certainly like the length of the queue in terms of the number of documents will be dramatically shortened when all of those are finished. Um, I think optimistically within, by the end of the year, let's say. Um, so that will be a significant help. Um, the other thing that's uh, you know ongoing that's affecting the, the time in queue is the transition to the V3 RFC format, which, um, which started in October of last year. And um, I think mo the bulk of the issues uh, that surfaced uh, with the transition have been ironed out. Um, but I think if John Levine is with us, he can, um, he can give more of an update 
uh, when the IAB comes on, uh, but we're, we're getting to the place where we at least know the, the length of time that editing uh, a, a V3 page of a document takes, um, so that's, that's getting smoothed out. So next, unless I don't see anybody else from the IAC who wants to respond, so I think next in queue we have Ron. So I cannot hear Ron. Can others hear Ron? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. OK, sorry. Um, I'd like to recommend that draft authors run their text through a tool like Grammarly or Hemingway or Pro Writing Aid to get it in pretty good shape while it's being reviewed. So that way, the poor RFC editor won't have to you know, go crazy with um, uh, grammatical stuff that could have been taken care of by a, a piece of software. And it might even be a good idea if the IESG would recommend some tools that uh, get to a style that they like to see. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, Barbara is next. I just wanted to um, say briefly that um, independent of whether or not any of these wonderful people decide to run again. Barbara, if you're sending audio, you're very faint. Well, maybe it would help if I put my microphone in front of my mouth. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so as the NOMCOM chair, I would just like to, you know, um, encourage that independent of whether any of these wonderful people will be running again for the IESG, I would love to see people running against them. Um, competition um, in things like this is really a good thing. I think it encourages a, us all to be our better selves and to um, try to do better. And so... Um, I don't think people should uh, ask whether or not um, somebody else is running before they put their name in the hat. And even if they don't get the position, um, again, the experience is really good to have. So thanks. Okay, Michael is next. Uh, yes, I'm uh, job driving for uh, Kathleen who asks, if anything is being done to increase the rate of output for the IESGQ uh, for publication, she asked, an AD review expectations, understanding that holding documents up holds up real work progress, et cetera. And I guess John also said that some of the RFC editor questions will happen in the IEB part that was asked. Okay. Anyone on the IEC want to speak to this one? Uh, yeah, so I I know that at least for me, the queue of documents for AD review is getting pretty long. Uh, and we have been trying to do some things to speed that up. I was able to request that uh, my ISG colleagues take over a few of the documents that were sent to me uh, pretty shortly after they were sent to me to sort of short circuit my very long queue and get it to someone who could handle it a lot quicker. Uh, and that seems to have been pretty effective. So uh, I think we're going to keep in mind the ability to do that in the future. We have a standing item on our informal telechats to ask if there's any documents that we should switch around. Uh, and you know, again, speaking only for myself, I expect to be making uh, better progress with my own queue in the coming months. All right. Barry, did you want to respond? But it's uh, really helpful for the document shepherds to keep up on this also. And if we are not responding quickly enough, 
um, that's part of what the document shepherds are supposed to be doing is uh, ping us and ask what the delay is, if there's anything you can do to help us. And uh, sometimes just the reminder is what we need to push it up uh, in our queue and, and, and get it going. Warren, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Right, right. Hold on. Oh, yeah, I just want to get a second what Terry said. Um, it's also, you know, if you're a draft author, please make sure that you actually integrate comments when you get comments back. And also, if you're not getting a response, make sure you just ping the AD. Um, you know, often you end up with huge numbers of emails in your email box and you might miss one. So if you're waiting on an AD to do something, Please just ping them and make sure, or ping them to make sure that they haven't lost track of it, et cetera. All right, I think we will move on to David. Thank you, Lisa. Can you hear me? Uh, uh. You are muted, but I'm going to assume that it's working. Uh, David Skenazi, Google. Just on the topic of lengthy reviews uh, with the ISG, I would just like to offer a suggestion uh, for ISG members. Uh, we ha I've had experience with a bunch of documents where we've gotten like very long and thorough review from the ISG, which is great and helpful. But I'm thinking maybe it is not in the best interest of the IG to spend so much time on editorial comments on documents. In particular, I've had instances where one AD made editor, ver, like acknowledged editorial comments. I made the changes, and then another AD made editorial comments that directly contradicted those changes. All that to say, I think there is value in having the ISG, you know, review the documents and make sure, like you know, for example, it has valid security. Um, but let's maybe shorten the reviews and not like nitpick everything editorially. We have the RFC editor that can do this. Um, just a thought. Ben, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure Warren was also trying to speak up as well, but uh, just my own response to David is that uh, I have actually asked the RFC editor directly uh, maybe a year or two ago about what their stance is on getting, uh, on, on I guess leaving editorial issues to the RFC editor. And the response I got was, please report issue editorial issues with the document as early as you can. Uh, and for many of these documents, I'm not seeing them until, or I'm not reading them until uh, ISG evaluation. And so that's like the earliest chance that I have to make the sort of comments. Uh, I do want to reiterate that you know, the ISG ballots have a comment section, which is usually present on, on most of the things you get email about. There's also sometimes the discuss section, of course, which has the blocking comments. Uh, but the comment section on the ballot is explicitly non-blocking comments. And uh, by putting remarks in there, we're sort of saying, uh, we are okay if you completely ignore this. Uh, some of them we may really want you to pay attention to and, and do something in response to, but uh, if you completely ignore them, we're not supposed to get put out or anything because of it. Uh, it is, after all, just a comment. Yeah, and this is Warren. I mean, ideally things like editorial nits would be caught um, in working group last call or ITF last call or before it hits the ISG. Um, but, you know, I know that my ADHD slash OCD won't really let me just ignore a bunch of typos, editorial things without mentioning them. But as um, Ben said, you know, most of them do just end up in the comment section unless it's something which is a significant enough issue to be a discuss. Um, there is also the fact that the RFC editor has a lot of work to do and there's a definite cost with it. Um, if we can make the document not have 27 typos before it hits them, I think that that's always helpful. Or is that not actually what exactly we're talking about? But um, there are a lot of documents that show up just with monster big typos or 
you know, basically unreadable. Sorry, I'm sounding grumpy. Did you want to respond as well? My mic is hot. Uh, <laughs> so, David, I just wanted to acknowledge absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we as the ISG can do better a better job on is making sure that we don't duplicate feedback, whether it comes in discuss form uh, or in comments if there's nothing new to add. So uh, this is, I think, uh, an artifact that different ISG members have different workflows about whether they read other people's comments, then they provide theirs or go to where their starting point is. But we can try harder at that. That's fair. Thanks. Okay, I think we are good with that one. So we will move on to Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. The little bars are moving. Mark Nottingham. Uh, so I want to follow on to the, to, to the last discussion. Um, ben, you said you'd, you'd talk to the RFC editor. I'd encourage you to talk to authors. Uh, the experience of an author putting a, a document together, going through working group last call, then going through IETF last call, then going through the RFC editor is onerous, especially for new authors. And when they get a tremendous amount of very detailed feedback from the ISG about grammatical issues, and sometimes it conflicts or it conflicts with what the RFC editor says, I've seen that happen. And then they have to go through the same process with the RFC editor. It's not really a great experience, especially when the feedback comes in a huge slab of an email where you have to go and find the right part of the document to edit and then affect that edit and then go through the whole thing. At least with the RFC editor, it's much more automated and they do the work for you. Um, I'd really encourage you to think about what the editor exper experience is here, especially since so many working groups are using uh, more modern tools like GitHub and you could give them a pull request, for example. Um, and, and, the, and the statement that you know comments can be ignored Yes, we, I've heard that said a number of times. I've been working the IETF now for 20 years, and I still don't feel like I can ignore comments from an AD. It just, to a new author, that just won't even enter their mind. So I really encourage the ISG to think about how the time spent here. If we're really doing this to save time and money from the RFC editor, then there's something really broken going on, and I hope that's not the motivation. Hey, Mark. Uh, thanks. That's definitely a great point. Uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned people who are using a GitHub-based workflow. I do try to check for if there's a, a document using GitHub and make a pull request for the boring editorial stuff. Uh, I guess I'd more reliably do that when it's a document at AD review than an ISG evaluation, but I definitely do try. Uh, so that's uh, a great point. Um, I think, speaking just for myself, uh, it's not really an attempt to save the money or time from the RPC staff. It's more that uh, I have this problem where I notice things, and by the time I've noticed the thing and gotten past it while well, I'm just reading from my own comprehension, the incremental time to note it and get it fixed is not very much for me. Uh, but I will definitely try and consider the effect on the authors in the future. Yeah, this is Warren. I guess I'll largely just follow in from what Bart Ben said. Once I've noticed in it, it's really, really hard not to not to comment on it and just leave it lie. But also, um, you might be making a generalization there, um, Mark. I recently published a document, and I got a bunch of editorial comments back during um, ISG review, and I thought they were really helpful and friendly. Uh, you know, I went through, I integrated them. Almost always, there's other stuff one has to integrate um, after the IESG review. And so while I had the document open, going through and fixing the typos that I accidentally left in, changing things like DNS revolver to DNS resolver, I think was really helpful. And it's the sort of thing that the RFC editor might miss. I'd rather fix things like that while I've got the document open than end up having an errata because of a typo.
Okay. Next is John. Yeah, I, I want to reinforce a lot of what, what Mark said uh, and, and to repeat a comment which has made, been made in the chat, which is that when it's coming from the ISG, treating comments that show up in the post last call process as just comments ignoring the, and ignoring them is hard for very experienced participants and probably impossible for newcomers. But what I wanted to say was to make a vague suggestion for the ISG to think about. Um, 25 years ago when I was on the ISG, probably too long for anybody else to remember, uh, we used to view the ISG catching problems which survived working groups and last calls and now document shepherds in between working groups and last calls. Uh, when something got that far and no comments were raised and the ISG hadn't noticed them, we treated it as a process failure. Not something to scream at somebody about, but something to think about what could have been done differently, which would have prevented the ISG from needing to catch and deal with those comments the last minute. If the ISG feels like they need to lodge discusses against the document, that's an indication that something somewhere along the line in the process failed and failed fairly seriously. And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't act as a final check in that regard, but I am suggesting that maybe it's time to go back and think about ways of doing a post-mortem, a re-examination of what caused the document to get to the ISG in the shape in which the ISG feels like they need to make a serious protest. And that applies equally well to editorial issues, to um, language which we no longer approve of and should not have approved of 20 years ago, or whether it's a technical problem. Just, just a suggestion for you to collectively to think about. Thanks. Boy, that kept resounding silence. No, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure if I needed to be called or I was moved to the talking queue. Sorry. sorry. Yes, yeah. please begin. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we have a um, discussion about, you know, the, the length of the meet echo time slots on the uh, working group chairs mailing list and given how they, I think, really the time management and how, you know, the working group chairs serve <laughs> at the demand of the IESG. I think it would be good for the ISG to start thinking about how in future virtual meetings we're, um, you know, managing the time there. Right now it was starting from starts on the clock, ends on the clock, um, and then basically people started to argue for five more minutes. And I think um, I'm, I'm voting on the side of having a lot more leeway on that, that working group chairs can ask. Um, you know, if people can stay over, I mean, it's not as if the next uh, working group rushes in, but attendees can easily say, no, we've got a conflict or we don't have a conflict, right? So I think we have a lot more flexibility nowadays, but we're actually in the tooling side rather going the opposite way. So it would be great if, if I, ISG could get involved, given how it's probably a good part of your responsibility to manage that. Yeah, thanks. I agree. I think this is a place we can make a lot of improvement. I do think, um, you know, having the, the start times fairly uh, strict is important uh, in terms of making sure that everybody who wants to get to a session can get to it. So I don't think we want the sessions to bleed into each other. Um, even if there's, you know, a core group who can keep talking, that's a, a little bit uh, exclusionary towards people who have another commitment. Um, but yeah, the, the lead times on either side is um, is something we need to work on and uh, I don't know I, I mean I think we have the feedback from the on the working group chairs list um, it's possible we might add something to the meeting survey just to get a sense from people of what they're looking for so appreciate well I mean there's the 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 point, point about, uh, about 30 uh, minutes 30 in minutes before, before protesting right so like when rooms are open that people come in obviously there is no official program but all the uh, you know side discussion before 
um, and then um, if we can stay afterwards at least until you know the next meeting is officially scheduled right when there are breaks and otherwise right there is a total miss of using the same tooling to having ad hoc you know working group site meetings when you see that you're running over we had those easily in the past um, when when there were rooms available right so there are always more options that we currently don't have with Medeco. yeah point taken thank you um sam Sam, if you're speaking, I cannot hear you. Try one more time. <laughs> hmm. Okay, it looks like Sam is having some difficulty, so uh, uh, we'll come back to you, Sam, if we can, if you can get it sorted out, and we'll move on to Ted. like we're having same similar permission issue um, <laughs> with Ted perhaps people all I see is people like appearing and disappearing from the queue this is finally working it looks like um, yes I want, to go back to, back, I want to go back to document editing as I think about my own RFCs the RFC editor edits with an extremely light touch and when I think about the documents that I've reviewed at last call I think that many of them would benefit from more, far more significant editing than I typically see the RFC editor do. And so if authors don't want that sort of editing to happen or those sort of comments to come in at last call or during IESG review, my suggestion is that they or their working groups send us better documents um, and do a stronger editing pass at the working group, even if it means assigning an additional person to edit the document. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Not seeing any anyone from the ISG piping in, so I think we will move on to Jonathan. All right, so um um, so at the um, in the in-person meetings, our meetings have always been in you know quanta of half hours, so hour, hour and a half, two hours. Um, we've in this meeting it was 50, 50 minutes or hundred minutes instead, and I feel like especially given the friction of AV troubles, that's a little tight. Uh, my group didn't need a full you know wouldn't need a full hour and a half so I thought well I guess I'll have to do 50 minutes but it's turned out to be sort of tight for me so I think that going forward assuming we're still going to do virtual uh, half hour quanta in my opinion rather than 25 minute quanta would work better just as a my personal opinion so okay thank you that's good feedback it's a little tricky because we're trying to keep the whole day short due to time zones, but it's, it's good feedback. Anyone else in the queue? Ted, Ted Lemon, are you gonna make another run at it or anybody else? Okay, looks like no. So, Barry? Yeah, there, there's a question in Jabber from KHA. He says, uh, request IESG to also consider what new terminology drafts slash RFCs are introducing, and is it necessary? Preference should be not to add new pixie dust all the time to make contributions look cool. Okay. 
I'm not sure that I really followed that, but if somebody else did and wants to respond. Okay. Um, I guess if this is about the terminology draft, maybe send an email to Gen Dispatch and, and we can try to follow it up. Oh, Ben, did you have? Yeah, I, if I understood the question correctly, it was to say that whenever we have a new technology draft in front of us, we should take a close look to see if it is defining new terms that are not needed, that uh, there are existing terms that could be used uh, and would work just fine. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable point. Uh, we should not define new terms just because we can uh, and limit that to just when there's a particular need for it. Uh, I also, it looks like Ted Lemon did manage to put into the jabber what he was intending to say at the mic. Uh, if I can get back to it in my history. Um, okay, yes, he was gonna say that we have a process for announcing interim meetings and having the working group meetings go along without that being on the schedule would violate the two-week notice process. Okay, that's just a statement. Uh, it looks like it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that seems true. Other responses from ISG? Okay, uh, John is next. With regard to that terminology comment, I, I agree. <clears throat> and I agree with Ben's excellent summary that we shouldn't be adding new terms we don't need to. But again, this is something that shouldn't fall on the ISG. If, we, if an IETF last call is meaningful, then people should be reading these documents at I, at, during last call and raising these terminology objections long before it falls on the ISG to notice these things and sort them out. So I, I think we're, we're putting too much responsibility in the ISG, which is making things too burdensome and is vastly increasing the stress on authors relative to catching these things earlier and dealing with them during the normal course of document development. Okay, Ben, did you want to respond back? Uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to respond back with another question. Uh, and I think there was some discussion in the chat as well about uh, uh, hoping that we did not have to go to a place where we had explicit signed reviews of the document to confirm that it actually got read. Uh, and so my, my question back to John would be, uh, do you think that the ISG should be putting discusses on documents for a process failure if it seems that the document has not actually been reviewed by the ITF during the last call? Um, especially for working group documents. Uh, if it looks like that those documents got into last call without adequate review and then got no review on the last call, I would expect the responsible area director to bounce that document before it even goes into ISG review. Now that's an answer to a little different question, but yes, I think we are, I think we, we are taking, the whole community is taking IETF last call much less seriously than we did even a decade ago, much less a decade or two and a half. And, uh, and I think we need to try to figure out a way to ameliorate that. And if the community doesn't care enough about a document to carefully review it, then we don't have IETF consensus for that document, no matter what IESG reviews or other rituals we go to. And we really need to start taking that problem seriously. That's a fair point. I, I don't think I can disagree with what you say there. So I'm hopeful that we can get a uh, consensus in the community about the right approach. Yeah, I, I, I'd much rather have a discussion in the IASG and in the community about what that right approach is, rather than try to work it out on, on this call. And I don't think I've got the right, I've got ideas which are any better than anybody else's, but I'm certainly noticing the problem. Follow up.
sure whether you called on me, but uh, here I am anyway. Um, this is Barry Leba. Uh, John, the back when dinosaurs roamed the internet, we had people who were, uh, we, we had many fewer documents going into last call. We had people who were more broadly scoped, uh, more people who were more broadly scoped. We have a much more focused group of people now, and I think it, it has been difficult to get a lot of last call comments. Uh, I would love to see many more last call comments. I think the directorates and area review teams have helped somewhat in that regard because we at least push a few last call reviews. Um, we hope that most of the work will be done in the working groups and that last call will surface a relatively small number of comments that gives us the cross area review. But um, it is a very difficult problem and, I, and I, I'd love to see much more uh, interaction, much more engagement in the community with last call. And so I agree with that point. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I disagree with anything you've said. Uh, and it's speaking as, as one of the residual dinosaurs. Uh, but um, uh, at the same time, when we make very broad claims for ITF consensus, that presumes an informed review somewhere. Uh, and uh, and to the extent to which we're not getting it, we're uh, we're risking the ITS the ITS credibility, uh, as well as again putting far more pressure on the ISG's members to act as uh, as, as 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 overall supervisors of the technical quality of work, which we can't reasonably expect all of them to understand all of the time. And we need to work, figure out a way to work on that a little bit. And certainly, as Stuart just said in the chat, for, for one of these documents to get even in the last call <clears throat> without evidence, the response of what he has read it carefully is, is, is a bad sign. Warren, did you want to respond? Yep, yep. Um, so, I mean, there's not very much I can say other than just to agree with uh, Barry and John. The problem is, from looking at our consensus processes, there's a, you know, you have to make sure that all of the outstanding comments are addressed. There's very little that says that there has to be a good, strong show of support or how one judges that level of support. Um, actually, recently went through to try and find you know, a document that says you need at least n people saying that this is a good idea or, you know, very strong levels of support. And I couldn't find that document in order to point at. Um, so A, if somebody has that, that would be really helpful. And B, maybe we need to sort of change our worldview. So instead of it's not, there's consensus when you've addressed all of the outstanding comments and everybody's no, you know, everybody stopped complaining to we need much stronger shows of support from a working group before the chairs are um, sort of willing to send the document forward. And more, you know, a lack of comments in the IETF last call does not mean that there's consensus. It either means that nobody's read the document or maybe everybody fully agrees, but that seems unlikely. Um, I suspect this is better a conversation we should have offline um, you know, we can have it on a mailing list and hopefully a lot of people will comment and review. So technically we have six minutes left, although the session will stay up if we run over. We have five people in queue. And now we have four people in queue and we haven't done the IAB open mic yet. So um, please keep your comments and responses brief. Dominique. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the um, meet, TECO meetings have been going really well, um, and I've been really impressed with them. Uh, just a quick question about the, the virtual hum. Is there like a, a minimum number of people that need to participate or minimum volume? or And also, how are people finding it in general? Because there's been a couple where people are not quite sure what to do. Thanks. Go ahead, Martin. Thank you. 
law measure. The bins. There's a draft about this in Shmu. If you're interested in the spec, you want to restart your your audio is cutting off. You might want to restart your comments. Oh, great. Um, okay, well, let's try that again. Um, so, first of all, it will show up as Niente. Okay, I think we lost Martin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And perhaps what he was saying is that uh, there, there's no hums. It will show up as niente. So there's, you know, there's a bucket that captures uh, very low or, or no humming. And if you have feedback about the tool, please send it to Tools Discuss uh, at IETF. That's where we're having um, discussion about it. And I think opinions vary. So please bring yours to the Tools Discussion list. And we will move on to Torless. Yeah, was uh, with with respect to the last call, right? I think um, maybe it's also an issue of uh, the document shepherds and the uh, working group chairs maybe trying to uh, initiate before the end of the last call, uh, cross uh, you know review in wherever there might be filling of the uh, um, most useful additional feedback or even earlier than the last call and. Uh, I think maybe that needs to be exercised more from my own experience. And I I'm, I'm think I'm to blame there as well, not doing that enough. Warren, did you have a response? Yeah, so I kind of want to respond by Thurland's discussions in the Jabber. Um, I think that one of the problems is that there authors who push really strongly for their document to go to working group last call and the chairs are willing to push back for a while but after you know five or six or seven times of but my document's ready for working group last call ah nobody's read it but my document's ready for working group last call ah nobody's read it um eventually it just becomes easier for the working group chairs to say eh, okay whatever let's just push this up to the isg um and I don't really know how we can fight that. I mean, chairs or volunteers, um, at some point after they've been shouted at enough times by authors, uh, it just becomes easier to say, all right, whatever, you know, I will kick this up to someone else and make it their problem. Um, I think the only legitimate way to try and fix that is for everybody who participates to either be willing to read and comment on drafts, even if they don't find them interesting, um, or to provide support to the chairs when the chairs say, you know, author X has said 17 times now that they think the document has consensus. Can people please read it and comment? Um, so I think this is sort of a problem that lies with all of us. Chairs need support as well. Um, if authors are pushing on chairs and you're a working group participant, please feel free to sort of help the chair push back. Obviously not all of them need it, but sometimes it is helpful. Well, so my my experience with a document that had many pieces of, in, you know, in uh, with expertise from 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 different areas was that you know if we would have found a way to earlier, you know, try to ask strongly for a review from expert in these other um, working groups on the specific parts that could have sped up the process, right? Because uh, so it's it's really all in I, I, uh, ISG and IEEE review that this is all backloaded, right? And I'm just saying that we could attempt to have these out of working group reviews earlier on, right? Because I think you're right that there will not be more review from the working group itself. Um, but if the review from people outside of the working group comes before it goes through last call, there is probably a better chance to to get better resolution than in the rush and and uh, and publish um, you know phase, which you know I, 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 ITF and ISG review often is. Yep, and, and just to be clear, I wasn't actually commenting um, on on any specific draft. Just to, to make it clear. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, um, Phil. 
Yeah, you um, I, I was just going to address J John's point earlier. Uh, yes, uh, things were different 25 years ago, and so was the were the drafts that we were producing then. And since then, we've got uh, strong security requirements that have to be passed, strong NIST requ uh, um, IANA requirements. We've put a whole set of requirements on the qual that have improved the quality of the drafts. But the other thing that we've done that's uh, probably changed the process is there are a lot of cases where you need to get a registration and we've made RFC required or documentation required, which ends up being, well, it's got to be an RFC. And when we discuss things like making internet drafts permanent, et cetera, and when we have that whole RFC process, one of the things that I don't think was really clearly addressed there was that if you're going to make um, the threshold an RFC is required because that's the only thing that is permanent, then what you end up doing is forcing a lot of stuff to go through the ISG that perhaps never needed to go through there in the first place because all that somebody wanted was a code point for their uh, idea that maybe if it just we gave them the code point and they went away and it died afterwards uh, wouldn't have bothered anybody so we're creating work by insisting on processes that are a bit pathological Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of truth in that. Um, the extensiveness of the review is clearly uh, tied to what you say. So, okay, I'm not not seeing anyone else in the IHG who wants to respond. And given the time, I think we're going to move on to the IAB open mic since we're already over time for this session. Um, so we will move on to that. Okay, so we will also start with an introduction round. Hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm on the IAB ex officio. Hi, uh, I'm Colin Perkins. I'm the IRTF chair. Watch, work for Akamai on IAB. Colin, if you can try. Yeah, Colin has problems. So we go on with Yari. I'm Yari Arko, member of the IAB. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Ventura, member of IAB. Jian Khan? We can't hear you, Jian Khan. Now, maybe. Uh, Try again. Hello. Yes, uh, I can hear you. I'm Jian Kang Yao. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Jian Kang Yao, IAB. John? Take John later, so we go for Mark. Kicked. Okay, now we have John. Let's go for John first. Sorry. Hi there. I'm John Levine. I'm the acting RFC uh, sort of series editor. Thank you. I don't see Mark, so we go for Stephen. All right, Stephen Farrell, just look in here.
Tommy. Hello, I'm Tommy Polly. Um, Ivy. Hardiker, I'm on the IB and also the guides lead. Um, Chenbin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Chenbin, IB. Okay, now let's try for Colin. The IB, if you can hear me this time. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, Colin Jang's IB, thanks. Thank you. And I think we're still missing Mark. I mean, I know he's here. Maybe he also has trouble connecting. So that's Mark Nottingham missing. And uh, I'm Mia Kudun, I'm the IB chair. And I believe that's everybody. So we can start the open mic. I guess we already exhausted all the questions in the previous round or people just want to go, don't want to go home. They just want in. Okay, we have John. Uh, just apropos of some of the questions were, that, were, that were asked in the, in the last round about uh, slow documents. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to what Alyssa and the other people said. Um, Cluster 238 totally screwed up our schedule because essentially 45 documents were basically thrown into a bucket over the past four years and then dropped back into the queue all at the same time, um, which caused a huge backlog in the past couple of months. The, 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 the production people have been working diligently. They're mostly all in, in off 38 or better, off 48 or better. And it seems likely that most of them will, will be published by next month. Um, beyond that, um, the, switch to, the, the switch to XML documents uh, was very disruptive. I mean, partly it meant that, the, that everybody had to learn new tools. Partly it means we now have new permanent jobs we have to do. And in particular, uh, in the V3 XML, it's full of semantic tagging, which is great. But it means that somebody actually has to do the semantic tagging. And if the authors don't do it, which at this point, many are not, um, the RPC has to go through and do the semantic tagging too. And uh, there's some, <clears throat> I'm attempting to look at how, how can we make our tools better? Here, let me take this off. How can we make our tools better? And also, um, you know, can we encourage people to submit stuff in V3 with the tags pretty much in place, which will save a fair amount of time. And on the, also on the back end, um, I know a lot of people want to use GitHub for Auth48 and, and, and other stuff. Um, we have an experiment doing that. Um, none, of us are, none of us are opposed to it. We're just worried that um, using GitHub can su suggest pe subject people to an enormous blizzard of of comments and remarks and pull requests and issues and stuff. And we're trying to figure out how to do this in a disciplined way so that the so that the editors get the notices get the notices they need to respond to without having to wade through a lot of stuff that they don't. The current pro the current experiment looks fairly promising. Um, but I think we we have we have a fair amount of work to do. And just finally just in my personal viewpoint, um, I think I would want to be willing to push back a little more when a document shows up that clearly needs a lot of work. That I want to, I would like the RFC editor, whoever it turns out to be, to you know, to continue to have the the, the realistic authority to say, uh, this document needs to go back and have more work from the working group before it's ready to edit, just because you know that it's 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 not well enough written, or it need, you know, there's there's too much obvious changes that it needs. So uh, we have plenty of work to do, and I look forward to doing it all with you. Thank you for Thank the more extensive report here. Um, we still have the opportunity for questions for the IB or for John. I don't think I see anybody. So that means we're only 10 minutes over, which is pretty good, I think. Uh, and I will hand back to Alyssa for final words. No final words. I think we are done. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.